So we are now turning our attention to chapter 18 on activity-based costing. As always, we have a series of learning objectives and we are going to be working through these learning objectives using the exercises that we have in CNEL. So activity-based costing, just to be clear, it seems like if you just look at the, the chapter titles for these three chapters, this being the third, we have job order costing, process costing, and then activity-based costing. It seems like looking at the chapter titles that this is a whole new way to do costing. And while it is a new approach, it is not a substitute for job order or for process costing. A company is still going to use job order or process costing or some hybrid that they create for themselves. And as I think I mentioned in an earlier class, um, a company could use job order for some types of products and process costing for other types of products. Activity-based costing is a separate layer. And, and really the point of activity-based costing is related to those, what up to this point, starting in chapter 15, we've been referring to as the factory overhead costs. It also could be used or can be used for some of the selling general and administrative, those period costs. The purpose of activity-based costing is to make sure we have as accurate a sense of, of our costs related to our products. And the reason it's important, I hope it's clear, the reason we need to know an accurate, accurate cost for the products that we're making is so that we are setting pricing for our customers appropriate, appropriately to make sure that we are making the margin that we want, to make sure that we are not underselling our, our products. So setting the price too low and therefore eating into our profit margin. At the same time, we don't want to set our price too high because we would then lose business. So if you think about that, the logical extension of that, if we set our price too high for some products, then we're going to lose that business. If we set it too low for other products, we're going to have lots of people wanting to buy those products because we're not charging enough to cover our costs, maybe. And so it's really going to have both, both directions have a detrimental effect on the running of our business, the profitability of our business. If I had to summarize activity-based costing and the difference between what we're going to do in this chapter and what we started doing in chapter 16 related to how we allocate that overhead. I've been using the term, the traditional approach to overhead allocation since we learned how to do that in chapter 16 where we had one cost pool and one cost driver. The cost drivers that we've been talking about are generally direct labor hours, direct labor dollars, machine hours, something like that. But we had, if you think back to my hand-drawn flowchart, we have one cost pool where we put all of the overhead costs. And then we select one cost driver and all of the overhead costs are allocated based on that one cost driver. That's what we're going to review in learning objective two, single plant-wide factory overhead rate for product costing. That's what I've been referring to as the traditional approach. We can take it one step further than that and maybe get a better sense of our overhead costs by using multiple overhead rates based on our, our processes. Um, and finally, we will get to how do we base these rates on activities as opposed to departments or work cells. So you'll see the progression as we go through the exercises from one rate to multiple rates for different departments to basing our overhead allocation on activities, not on departments, because each department might have 
multiple activities that are happening in there. And so activity-based costing is a little bit more maybe sophisticated of an analysis of what is it we're actually doing, what actually drives these costs. And then just like we did in the last chapter, at the end, we will look at how, how can we apply these same concepts within a service organization or a service business. So because we have limited time today in our first, uh, our first work on chapter 18, I do want to go right to the exercises. Because exercise one is, is not anything new. As I said, it's review of what we have already been doing since chapter 16, allocating all of our factory overhead based on one cost driver. All the costs go into one pool, they get allocated based on one driver. And that's what we're going to do in our first exercise. Bach Instruments Incorporated makes three musical instruments, flutes, clarinets, and oboes. The budgeted factory overhead cost is $2,948,125. Overhead is allocated to the three products on the basis of direct labor hours. That is their cost driver. The products have the following budgeted production volume and direct labor hours per unit. Remember in our chapter 16 reference materials, as a reminder, very top link, traditional approach to overhead allocation. We have the three-step process outlined for you here. That's exactly what we're going to do in this first exercise. This is the traditional approach. It's what we've been using since chapter 16. So remember that that's there in case you need it as a reference. So the first step noted here as letter A is to calculate our budgeted rate. Can't get this to move. There we go. Is to calculate our budgeted rate. So this is done in the planning phase or before we actually start production. The calculation is the Numerator is the budgeted factory overhead. That's the about $3 million. The denominator is going to be the expected or budgeted level for the cost driver and our cost driver is direct labor hours. So I need to do a little bit of math here. And just give me a second to put these in. Sorry, I'm being finicky. Okay. okay, so I'm just gonna be doing the math across because we, we know that our denominator is going to be the budgeted or expected level of the cost driver. It's going to be how many direct labor hours do we expect to work? And we're not given that information directly. We're given what we need to to find it. So if we make 2,000 flutes and each flute takes two hours of direct labor, that would be 4,000 direct labor hours, right? Same thing for clarinets. If we make 1,500 clarinets and each takes three hours, that would be yeah, 4,500 direct labor hours. And if we make 1,750 oboes and each takes an hour and a half, that would be 2,625 direct labor hours. So our total direct labor hours that we expect to work Eleven thousand one hundred twenty-five direct labor hours. Everyone agree with that? So now we can find our overhead rate by taking the budgeted factory overhead cost 
of 2,948,125 dividing by our expected direct labor hours, 11,125. And I got a rate of $265 of overhead per direct labor hour. One cost pool, one cost driver. The overhead gets allocated to each individual product based on that one cost driver. How many hours of direct labor did we spend? It may be, it may be that that's a perfectly legitimate way of allocating all of those overhead costs. The only way we know that is by testing it out. As I said in an earlier chapter, we only make one product. We don't need to do any of these complications because all of the cost goes to that one product. But we don't know necessarily for this company, for Bach Instruments that makes three different types of instruments, we don't know that using just one measure, direct labor hours, is a reasonable way of allocating up those overhead costs. Maybe, I'm just throwing this out there, I'm not saying this is true. Maybe the flutes, because they're made of metal, um, take more cleanup time. You know, they create more of a mess when you're making the product. I don't know, maybe the others do because they're made from wood. Does it make sense then to have all of our maintenance or cleanup costs based on direct labor hours if one of them we know takes more time, takes more cleanup, takes special handling? Maybe it has to be stored at a particular temperature. I don't know. Because we're making multiple products that may have different cost characteristics, we might want to look at doing something other than this single cost pool, single cost driver. So next we have to figure out how much overhead would be allocated to each of the three products, assuming we made the, the expected number of units. So for our flutes, each unit is expected to take two hours so we would allocate two hours of overhead at $265 per hour for a total of $530 in overhead to each flute. Multiply that by the 2,000 flutes that we expect to make and $1,060,000 worth of the overhead would be allocated to the flute. Go ahead and do that for the clarinets and the oboes. Oops. Oh, it says round to the nearest dollar. Since it says round to the nearest dollar, I put the per unit at 398. Then I'm going to base the total on the 397.50 that it actually is. So we don't end up with a rounding error. So this is the traditional approach. This is what we have been doing every time we've looked at overhead since chapter 16. Any questions on this exercise? 
check marks in there. Everybody okay with that part? That's just the review. Let's move on then. Oops, get my drawings off the screen there. Yep. Yep, so the, the actual number per unit is $397.50. And that's what I use to calculate the total, but it asks us for the um, total and the per unit to round to the nearest dollar. So you needed to use the 397.50 to get the total for the oboes. It's kind of Like okay. just that it's asking for the rounded number, but it won't accept the rounded answer. Yeah, so if you, yes, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's a little challenging that if you rounded it off and put in the 398 and then, um, and then tried to calculate the total based on that rounded number, it would mark it as wrong. I agree. We know, though, if we look, here that this needs to be that total. So if we had used the 398, we would have ended up with a total here that was not the correct total. I'm also, I also think it's possible, although kind of bizarre, that they, based on the way they ordered the columns, that they calculated the totals based on some percentages, you know, um, maybe they did like this. I'm not suggesting this is a good way to do it. Clearly, I don't think it's a good way because I didn't do it that way. But they could have done like this. Um, looked at, and I already erased the totals here, but they could have looked at the total hours and divided the total based on those total hours. So 4,000 hours for flutes divided by 11,125 times 265. It's a bit convoluted in my mind, um, but they could have done it that way. And maybe, so they calculated the total for the oboes first and then divided by the number of oboes to get and then rounded. I'm mm -hmm. gonna, I'm gonna say that's how they did it because they put the columns in that order. To me, that's that's not the most. When I did it, I had the, uh, so I had the total hours still. Uh -huh. So the 2000 times the two. Yeah. And then I multiplied that by the 265 yeah. to get uh, 1 million and 60,000. Yeah, you could have done that. But yeah. then I also, I just multiplied that. Unit price by 265 to get the other column. But if you want to take total overhead, so you get that 1060000 and then divide it by the per unit. Yeah. That's another way of. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, and I think that's probably how they were thinking about it because the 695, 625, using that approach, that number wouldn't need to be rounded. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I just. To me, I don't, I wasn't thinking of it from the totals. I'm thinking, you know, what's the per unit? It's the e it's actually the easier, in my mind, it's the easier yeah. math to do it that way because you're working with smaller numbers, so it's easier to picture it. But I agree, it's a little weird. So I know we've had stuff in previous problems where we have like the budgeted mm -hmm. costs and then we have what the actual cost is. Is this basically just showing us like almost how they got the budget cost? No, I think, so the question in the, in the classroom, if you can't hear, is, is this basically showing how the budgeted cost was derived? And no, I don't, I don't think that's the case. This budget is based on a whole bunch of line items. 
indirect labor, indirect materials, what are we spent, you know, utilities, rent, depreciation, whatever else we're spending. What part A is really the budgeted part, part B, and if I had written the exercise, I think I would have made it clear, and I said this, but you may have not picked up on what I was saying. It says, determine how much is allocated to each of the three products. And I said, if we make as many units as we're expected to make, because that's how the allocation works. That's step two in the traditional approach is we take this budgeted rate and multiply by actual level of the cost driver, actual hours worked. And so I made an, I suggested that if this was the allocation, which is what it says, allocated, that we spent exactly this, the amount of time we expected to and produced exactly 2,000 flutes and 1,500 clarinets. That's not likely um, that both of our estimates were perfect. However, if I had written this exercise, if I had written part B, I would have said, if I thought this whole thing through, I would have said, determine the amount we would expect to be allocated. Something that was more forecasting as opposed to this, which sounds like it's the actual allocation because that's not how allocation, the allocation is based on actual numbers and we don't have actual numbers. So I think that might um, lead to a bit of confusion. What, what kind of prompted the question is you pointed out that the total for the total factory overhead cost was the budget amount. And I know a lot of times when we've done the allocation, it doesn't come it, out exactly. So. I would say 100% of times in the real world, it doesn't come out exactly because it's based on two estimates. How much are we going to spend and how much of the cost driver are we going to use? And chances are neither one of those is going to be exactly correct. They're both going to be off. And it would be highly coincidental if they were both off by exactly the amount needed to make the total still come out. It's just not going to happen. Um, so yeah, I don't really like the way this is phrased. I understand why they might want to know these numbers in their budgeting process when they're trying to figure out, well, how much money are we going to make on flutes versus clarinets versus oboes? Which one of these is more profitable and therefore we should spend more of our maybe marketing resources trying to get people to buy flutes because we make more money on them or something like that. So it is a little bit, um, a little bit off because of that, off kilter. JP, you asked the initial question about the rounded amount. Are you okay with those now? Anything else you wanna talk about before we move on? So as I was explaining in the brief introduction, <laughs> the next step, and this was the second learning objective for the chapter, for the third, um, the next step after the single plant wide rate is that we have multiple rates based on something like departments as opposed to activities. And We'll get through this exercise. Um, I will ask you to, on your own, outside of class, work on exercise three. And then when we come in, this, uh, that would be a nice break point. And when we come back next class, we will pick up with exercise four, where we actually get into activity-based costing. But what you can see as we look at exercise two, again, we'll do this together and then I'll ask you to complete three on your own, is that we're still, even though we have multiple departments, we're going to allocate overhead based on multiple departments. We're still not basing it on what are those departments doing because we have two departments here, the pattern department and the cut and sew department. And we have divided the overhead for each one of those departments and for each department, we are going to allocate the overhead separately to each of our products. 
but nowhere in here do we talk about what are they doing in the pattern department or what are they doing in the cut and sew department? There are probably, there are almost certainly some overhead, some overlap between the two departments. For example, they probably don't both have their, their own custodial staff. There's probably one custodial staff that does the cleanup at the end of the shift in each department, you know, for the whole building, probably for the whole factory. And so the difference between what we're doing in this exercise and what we will do next week is you know, next week we would look at the activities, the, the maintenance as one activity and allocate based um, you know, to each department, each work cell based on that activity of cleaning or of maintaining equipment or of um, fix the IT department, fixing, fixing computers or whatever. But let's look at this exercise. Multiple production department factory overhead rate method. Handy Leather Incorporated is producing three separate gloves, small, medium, and large. The glove goes through each department as it's being produced. <clears throat> Handy Leather uses the multiple production department method and we have the budgeted overhead there. Direct labor estimated for each production department is there. And we use direct labor hours to allocate the production department overhead to the products. Direct labor hours per unit for each product, for each production department were obtained from the engineering records as follows. So we did what you might hear referred to as a time and motion study. The engineering folks actually looked at how this worked, formulated the ideal production and determined how much time each of the gloves should spend in each of the departments in terms of the direct labor. So determine the two production department factory overhead rates. The pattern department has $294,000 in overhead. And we're going to allocate that based on 42,000 direct labor hours. I can get my annotate up here. So that's a total of, what did I say? $294,000 for 42,000 direct labor hours. Or a total of $7 in overhead per direct labor hour. If you haven't already, go ahead and do the calculation yourself for the cut and sew. All right, everybody good so far? So now we have our, our rates. You can see that the rates are different for each department. We're still using the same cost driver. Now, do we have to use the same cost driver? Probably not. We could use different cost drivers for the pattern department and the cut and sew department. If we were using the traditional approach, we would have allocated the entire $854,000 in overhead based on the $98,000 in direct labor hour. And every direct labor hour would be treated the same or allocated the same overhead. And the rate would be somewhere between the seven and 10. And every direct labor hour would be treated separately. But in this approach, we're using multiple departments. And so each glove, Starting with the small glove, the small glove is going to take 0.3 hours in the pattern department. Then they're going to be charged $7 per hour. And then in the cut and sew department, it's going to take 0.4 hours. And that's going to be charged at a total of $10 per hour. <clears throat> 
And so when I do that math, I find $6.10 per unit. $6.10 of overhead will be allocated to each small glove. $2.10 from the pattern department and $4 from the cut and sew department. So very similar to what we had done. We're just adding a, a small complication by separating the departments and having separate overhead accounts. So where under the traditional approach, we had, whoops, we had just one Under the traditional approach, we had just one overhead cost pool. Now we have two. And so each product is going to be allocated to separate overhead amounts. What we're putting here in this exercise is the total. But really what's happening there is an allocation from each department from the pattern department, from the cut and sew department. And you can see there the totals. So that's where we're going to stop for today. As I said, please try exercise three on your own. And you're um, certainly use the check my work. When we come in next class, if you have questions on exercise three, I will be happy to answer those but I do not expect to go through the entire exercise together on Tuesday. Any questions before we call it a day and a week? This is the end of week four for this semester, four of 15. All right, thank you all for being here. See you next week. Recording.